Warning, massive spoilers for all four Sly games ahead. Also, that spells tit. Hmm. Sure not going to exploit that. Sly Cooper Thieves in Time is the latest addition to the Sly Cooper franchise. Created by Sucker Punch in 2002, the series garnered attention not only thanks to its exclusivity with Sony, but for its solid gameplay and competent writing. How old are you? Perfection has no age. They would go on to create the Infamous series, which achieved many accolades for aspects inherent within the Sly franchise. Later on, a HD collection was developed by fledgling company Sanzaru. While working on the collection, they created a tech demo for a fourth game. Sucker Punch liked it so much that they handed over the franchise, and it is precisely here that we plunge into the critique. You see, my fellow Cheshire Cats, when a game is renowned for the strength of its creative team rather than its technical prowess, you would think that said creative team would want to ensure the quality control was consistent across the board. You would think that the creators of Wee Ninja Star Thrower and Wee Mystery Piss Train would not be handed the reins of such a prestigious title, but they were, and I guess on that basis you may have perhaps already given up interest. What do you know? We never quite made it! Exciting though, wasn't it? Actually, the game received a lot of praise, and being a fan, I was rather excited. But you know, having played it, I feel there's an awful lot of oversights being made that simply must be addressed. Sure, it may not be grey and brown, but that doesn't mean it's perfect. This video will try and address the flaws within the game and look at exactly where it falls short, meriting any positive aspects where they're found. You will hear the words, in the original games, and tit, an awful lot. Sly 4 picks up where Sly 3 left off, the gang having hung up their collective masks and attempting to live normal lives. Nevertheless, the gang's old genius Bentley discovers that Sly's ancestral heritage, the Thievius Raccoonus, is mysteriously being erased page by page. You travel back to various time periods to set things right, help your ancestors, and discover the mastermind behind it all. Let's start with the gameplay and work our way down from there. The inclusion of the ancestors as playable characters means that the gameplay is incredibly varied, from the large assortment of different character abilities to the different modes of play. The Bentley segments, which actually have their own downloadable content, could easily engage you for the long haul alone. The foundation of the game is solid in terms of moveset, however this becomes less impressive when you realise that an awful lot draws upon the code from the first three titles, clearly learnt from Sanzaru's time spent on the HD collection. As a result, when something glitchy happens, such as a button press not responding as smoothly as you'd hoped, it is rather jarring. The environments are sprawling and the sheer amount of collectibles means you'll be playing for quite some time after you've finished the story. The worlds themselves vary in competence concerning practical game design. Some are simply meatier than others, offering better gameplay challenges which feels imbalanced. With so many modes and abilities, there's just not enough room to enjoy them all, and some feel rather tacked on. Though to be honest, as pointless as this ability is, I really can't get enough of it. Some structural elements appear to be poorly thought out. <laughs> In the original games, when a mission ended, you were left where you were, and if you wanted to change character, you had to go all the way back to the safe house manually. In Tit, they tried to solve this seemingly futile exercise in effort by instantly teleporting you back to the safe house. In actuality, this was a complete non-issue. It discourages you from exploring more during the story mode, and given the atrocious loading times in and out of the safe house, it becomes something of a nuisance. The lack of branching choices for missions is also a glaring problem, highlighting a linear design and makes the switch back to the safe houses feel, in the cases where you need the same character consecutively, rather poor. Pointless. The boss battles are probably the most satisfying part of the package. The developers deliberately decided to merge the strategical nature of bosses from the first game with the stylings of the latter two. Certain bosses aren't particularly fun or well designed, but the challenge feels more prevalent than previous titles. For the most part, the game isn't a chore to play, and Senzaru truly are solid developers on that front. That alone makes the game worth playing. Graphically and in-game animation-wise, the game is exceedingly well presented, and in all seriousness, I do agree that it's a welcome change of visual pace. It's a massive improvement on the original game's graphics, which, while wonderfully stylish, did have a few teething problems. La, 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 la. However, I feel that this overshadows a lot of shortcomings concerning the finer details of this game. In the first three titles, the cutscenes were evocative of a comic book, using angular, bold drawings to convey a sense of style that differed from the in-game graphics. Sanzaru appears to have missed the point, swapping this out for full motion animation, which appears to consist of an unpleasant flat quality of line, compared to the bold, appealing outlines of the originals. The cutscenes were deliberately limited, and to ignore that is a sign that Sanzaru just doesn't understand the artistic sensibilities needed for professional design. They also tend to have the dialogue match exactly what's happening on screen screen, paling in comparison to the subversive conflict between narration and visuals of the originals. It's a shame because occasionally they do take advantage of new styles in order to justify these cutscenes, and when they do so it tends to be decent. This is also the only time you will see Dimitri in the game and it's not only a pointless inclusion but incredibly underwhelming. I think they should have realised they'd simply never top this.
Character design on the whole appears to be rather weak in general. Carmelita is a very strong example of this, having gone from practical clothing to a skirt and bikini top. Certain details drag us closer towards the Uncanny Valley in a way the original series avoided so deftly. Major enemies used to sport strong designs and colours to stand out from their minions. By comparison, the Paradox's gang aren't so striking, and aside Sheriff Toothpick aren't particularly well themed, even taking intents to contrast into account. They often resemble their existing counterparts a little too closely, and when they don't, they're an incoherent visual mess. Disgusting! <laughs> the Paradox himself is actually a welcome change from the threatening villains of previous titles and is a wonderfully sleazy analogue of Sly Cooper himself. Flattery will get you nowhere. His character actually has the most interesting backstory and it's a shame that we don't see that become the focus of the game. There were a lot of specifics that were adhered to in the original games that made them feel grounded in some kind of classy flavour, be it the kind of missions that you had, or the themes of the villains, or the name locations. In the new game, the levels are mostly generic time travel set pieces. By far the worst offender is the medieval England hub, which isn't all that memorable. The real issue is the script. It not only pulls a lot of contrivances, but also a lot of unfunny dialogue and forced writing. Often you'll hear a line that feels too tenuous a justification for what's going on. Sure, Le Paradox had done some time in his youth. But he'd been squeaky clean ever since. All I ever really wanted to do is skate. And the whole thing made some strange kind of sense to him. Some characters behave rather two-dimensionally compared to their previous portrayals. Penelope has been mentioned a few times by fans, and while I feel it's a really compelling twist, I don't feel the character is given any realistic interpretation to this effect. We could have made billions in weapon design, the two most brilliant minds on the planet working together. We could have owned the world, but no matter. Let's get moving. We won't find the back entrance just standing around. Oh, oh sorry about that standing comment. Give you a break, Penelope. It's just an expression. The series was always very good at performing the domestication of disbelief, which is why it just comes off as rather superficial in the hands of a lesser writer. Truthfully, she isn't alone, as this story, packed to the gills with characters, finds little time to truly develop them all if at all. The humour, if you don't find the repeated use of nailed it funny, will definitely grate on you, particularly the huge number of referential jokes that cheapen the high-class nature of the franchise. Entire levels feel like they were purely based around one gag and everything had to adhere to it. Some parts are rather endearing, but mostly it's just pretty monotonous. In fact, some segments, which initially start out as a laugh, actually end up feeling rather embarrassing, and not in a good way. Shake, 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 Sinora, shake it all the time. You laugh now, but your kids will love it. It's a shame that this kind of stuff is lacking because the music is doing more work by comparison. The composer, Peter McConnell, not only created the score for Psychonauts, but also the latter two Sly games, and you can really feel his efforts here. But you know what the biggest problem with Tit is? It's a game about time travel that doesn't ever utilise time travel beyond window dressing. I mean, I'm not expecting Wells or Steinsgate levels of depth to your time travel, but if you're going to make a game that features a Back to the Future reference right off the bat, then you should at least include the basics. If it's a stealth game, then why not take advantage of that, having you affect events from afar? I would have preferred that to the way Sly's ancestry has been spelt out for me so far, ruining much of the mystery of their antics. I'm sure glad you made Sly's ancestor the fucking inventor of sushi. Much better than simply letting the character be a ninja from feudal Japan, the world must no. Bring on the trumpets! What does that mean? What about the rules of running into your past? Surely Sly and his gang would change along with their altered past and memories rather than remain the same. The whole thing is just so flimsy that it beggars belief. If I had to sum it up in a word, that word would be fanfiction. Seriously, when I was younger, and very stupid, the premise of this game was already grabbed by the fanfickers. It says a lot about its triteness and predictability. In short, I don't think we really needed a Sly 4. Part of Sucker Punch's brilliance was their sense of closure. Each game in the original series ended perfectly, and as a result, the sequels felt almost unexpected. Sly's 2 ending is a great example of this, which at the time I thought was one of the best endings I'd encountered in a video game. That is until I finished Sly 3. The fact that Sanzaru decided to hinge the entire game upon a silly gag that was never meant to be taken seriously in the third instalment says a lot about their lack of imagination. This could have been the game where we saw more aspects of the Sly universe, rather than try to retread old ground, even though the game is dickishly open-ended, there is now a lot of potential to create something different. Perhaps leaving the large groups behind and focusing on Sly's personal journey back home. Okay, so maybe none of that made sense to you or you simply didn't agree. And that's fine. I did enjoy the game for what it was, and I sincerely hope that Sanzaru picked themselves out of the mediocrity engaging with these criticisms. They clearly care for the franchise, and I can't begrudge them that. However, I know that the more verbose of you will want to begin fisticuffs with me over the art design, and hey, that's fine. Tell me how Carmelita's new look is a positive aspect. It's not like I can screen cap your deviant art page, but either way, I doubt it'll end well for anyone.
Hey, why don't you help a fella out by following our Facebook, Twitter, and website? Subscribe for more videos like this and the CCS podcast to watch a bunch of illegal immigrants talk smack about famous things. While you're at it, check out my good friends at Crimson Midget. I guess a professional feminine would call that progressive. And afterwards, Touch My Winkle, a site created by a good friend concerning platforming. And believe me, it's très amusant en fond. Man, whoa. That was like a whole other language or something.